key to discovering that is that I will follow you part. Praise the Lord. Kind of wet out there. Some of you made it through the torrential storms. Having a baptism at the end of the service today. To the person who's being baptized, I want you to know this lesson in being baptized, being baptized has some great truths about the new life in Christ, but it also means you can come to church when it rains and it won't hurt. <laughs> Not everybody remembers that part, do they? They're going to wilt in the rain or whatever it is. We're glad you're here, so I'm not going to fuss at you. I'm going to praise the Lord with you. God bless you. I'm glad you're here today. Uh, we're in our series of messages on the miracles of Jesus. Uh, before I get into the message, I, I want us just to stop and have a word of prayer. There's just been so many things going on in our country, in our land, our city. We've lost fire, four firefighters and uh, some others that are still critically ill. We've held these catastrophes, catastrophes in Oklahoma and to the Midwest. And there's a lot of people hurting today. And uh, I think it would, we'd just be wrong if we didn't stop here and thank God for His grace and His mercy and pray for people's... Uh, Situations that God would comfort them with their losses and heal those who are sick and just minister to so many that are hurting is so much today. Uh, we know what it's like to go through difficulties and tragedies and storms and crisis, but uh, there's some heavy, heavy clouds looming, not just in the, in the physical way in people's lives today, but in a very emotional way and a spiritual way. So let's just lift up, folks. If you want to just bow your heads and pray for folks, pray for these firefighters who, whose families are... Just been devastated at this time. Others who are still struggling in the hospital. And all these families who lost so many people in Oklahoma. Father, Lord, it's, we look at the catastrophes and the disasters that are around us. And know, Lord, that even though we might be untouched and grateful and thankful, there are so many today who are suffering. And so many that are hurting. And so many that have lost so much. Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to these families. Hover over them with mercy and grace today. You are called in the New Testament the God of all comfort. And Lord, we just pray for your comforting hand today to be upon these lives. And your healing hand. Lord, there's so many who sacrifice, especially in regard to these in Houston, so much for so many, and many times they're overlooked. And we're reminded in times like these, the danger and the price and the sacrifice that's made. Thank you for these, Father. and Minister to all these responders and rescuers and firemen and policemen, Father, who stand at the front lines every day and do things we don't even see. Minister and your great peace to so many hearts. Strengthen them. Look to you over the next days and weeks for you to continue to minister and draw them to your side and show them your nearness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Continue to keep these folks on your, your prayer list and on your hearts and minds uh, as we all do. Praise the Lord. Miracles of Jesus that we've been discussing. In fact, we're getting to number 11 today in this series. We'll have about four more. Of course, there were many more miracles in the New Testament that we haven't touched, but trying to get the, the ones if there was, you know, someone who was blind whose eyes were open. There might be four or five of those. We'll try just to focus in on one of those. But uh, when we get to this feeding of the multitude miracle, there's, there's, there's some things I want to cover today that we kind of haven't got into in regard to the ministry of Jesus into what's going on. When you get to this place of the miracles, we're about two years into the ministry of Jesus. And this miracle is very poignant and very powerful, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But it's in Matthew 14. We're going to read from that particular passage in regard to the feeding of the multitude. And I call it the feeding of the multitude because even though it says there were 5,000, and your Bible might say the 5,000 fed, Scripture makes it clear that there were much more than 5,000, at least 5,000 men alone. So as we get into this in Matthew 14, it says, And when he went ashore, he saw a great multitude and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. And when it was evening, the disciples came to him and saying, This place is desolate and the time has already passed, so send the multitudes away that we may go into the village and buy some food. They can buy some food for themselves. By the way, just to stop right here, this is the disciples telling Jesus what to do. 
you'll see that it is completely ignored. In fact, you may have discovered in your own life, when you take the time to stop and tell Jesus what to do, it's completely ignored. <laughs> it's not that he doesn't hear it. There is no plan B, which is your plan. There's plan A. And you'll see this as we read through this. It says, but Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. And ordering the multitudes to recline on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food. And breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave it to the multitudes, and they all ate and were satisfied. And that's a miracle. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And there were about 5,000 men who ate, aside from the women and the children. All right? Now, this particular miracle in the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that is listed in every gospel of the New Testament. When we've gone through the miracles of Jesus, we've seen that some of the gospels, one would have one and the others wouldn't have it, or two of the gospels would have a miracle and the other two would not have that particular one, or three. But this is the only one, singular miracle that is mentioned in every gospel. And I don't think that we need to run over that too quickly. We need to stop for a minute and try to figure out why is that this miracle so important that the Holy Spirit inspired it to be written in every gospel of the New Testament. Because that's, that's important. And I think it's important because there's some lessons that, that really need to be grasped here. Remember, in talking about the miracles, we've said that... Uh, there's basically two things we look at. We want to look at the, the miracle itself and how it testifies to the fact that, uh, of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That here's God in the flesh. Jesus is not just a man. He's God. He's the God-man. He's the man-God. He's all God. He's all man, but yet he's the God-man, man-God. If you think you understand that, just hold on. I don't either. All right? So anyway, it's, it's, it's the incarnation. God is veiled in flesh. Now, as I said, he's two years into this ministry, two years. He's been teaching his disciples. At the beginning of the ministry, he calls them. They're following him. They've witnessed miracle after miracle. They've seen action after action, supernatural thing after supernatural thing. They've seen him speak to the, to the, the very elements of the wind and the waves, and I mean, just settle it. They've seen him turn water into wine. They've seen dead raised, sick healed, blind eyes open, lepers cleansed. I mean, it's been one thing after another. But this is an important place in the ministry of Jesus. Two years into it, let me give you a kind of a brief scenario of what's happened. Remember when Jesus began this extensive Galilean ministry, it, it was, everything was public, all right? Uh, the Lord sought the crowds. He went to the town and city to city. And as he went, he, the miracles were performed. He, he proclaimed the gospel everywhere. He went. I mean, he openly manifested himself before all the people of Israel. And he offered them the opportunity to follow him, to, to receive the message of the kingdom. Uh, and we know from the very earliest days that the, the religious leaders were very skeptical. They, they didn't really uh, receive him. Uh, they, after becoming skeptical, then they become unfriendly. Now two years into it, they're becoming more hostile. Uh, the clearer Jesus' message became, more obvious what he was saying to the people, the, the higher the flames of their opposition rose, they just were rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you look right before this, because in all these things, we've not only talked about the miracle itself, but the lesson, Jesus has just received the word, and the disciples have, that John the Baptist has been beheaded. Herod has taken his head, all right? And so with the death of John the Baptist and Herod's fear that Jesus was John returned from the dead and somehow reincarnated into the body of Jesus, uh, there's this, not only this religious antagonism, now there is a political antagonism. So there's a lot of pressure that's coming off uh, onto the disciples and the Lord Jesus. And Herod probably would not at this point have hesitated to take the life of Jesus just like he did John the Baptist. So there's this, there's this whole uh, atmosphere that's kind of changing about the ministry of Jesus Christ. In the city of Nazareth, he's, his own town, he's already been rejected twice. And now it seems to kind of be pouring out into to, to the, the, the reaction, the reaction from the crowds, as you know, that uh, is, there, there's this reaction that it's becoming kind of fickle. It's mixed. Even though that, uh, uh, you know, they rejected the, the Nazareth, uh, 
the, the folks from Nazareth, they're, they're still fascinated. They still want to watch the miracles, you know, even though they tried to kill him at one time. They're, they're still kind of watching with all this young boy who grew up in their city. But here we are, Jesus is in his ministry, and there's this opposition in the religious realm. There's opposition on the political stage. Uh, the, the allegiance of the crowds now is becoming more vacillating. Kind of Remember one point that, uh, about this particular time that uh, the Bible says that there were, many were following him, and uh, then he spoke to them about discipleship and about the high cost of following him. It says that many departed. That's when right around at this particular time, when, Peter's told Jesus, they're leaving. And uh, Jesus turns to him and says, well, are you going to go too? He said, well, we'll not depart. You have the words of life. But, but at this particular time of Jesus' ministry, he's spending less time in public. And especially right here, when this is all taking place, he hears about John the Baptist. He's in Capernaum. And he says, uh, we need to talk. And they load up the boat and they head for the other side of the Galilee. And Jesus is kind of uh, withdrawing himself because he wants to get with his disciples. He wants to talk to them about, I believe, John the Baptist, the news in regard to him. So he leaves the air of Capernaum. I don't think he's afraid for his life. He's not running. Uh, no one could take his life, we know Scripture says, unless he gives it or he permits it. Uh, he avoids premature confrontation it seems from this this point on and you know in, even with Herod or, or, with, or with the others uh, more so than that though is he has to he has a word to speak to his disciples and two as we see Jesus often did he withdrew to spend time with his father to refresh himself so when the multitudes are gathered there and they're watching Jesus here comes someone bearing the news of John he turns to his disciples and we're going to the other side we, we need to go uh, he's taking them to, to speak to them. Well, the crowd's here, and obviously there's been a, a leak in the media or something, because Jesus is going to go to a quiet place, gets in the boat, tooling across the lake, and before he gets where he's going, those people who heard about where he was going have already left Capernaum, and now they're going to go where they know Jesus is going. And so there's a group of people now, thousands literally, and it probably grows as they go from village to village, and people say, where are y'all going? And they tell them, now, up to 5,000 men alone, probably, as one theologian said, probably closer to 25,000 when you had all the women and all the children and all the people who are coming to hear him. So in Matthew 14, 13, it says, Jesus gets in the boat, and they follow him on foot. Maybe they're watching him as he's crossing the sea. We don't know. It's, you know I've told you how big the Galilee was. You can probably see the boats from most locations. But anyway, they're arriving there. And of course, as they're getting there, then, then the sick are arriving and those who are a little slower, you know, uh, they, that had seen him, you know, uh, perform the miracles. They are all are kind of getting there. And uh, they're not there for, for spiritual reasons. You know, they're, they're kind of a circus atmosphere. They want to watch him perform the miracles. So even as they go there, Jesus on the boat with his disciples, even as they're going there, their motives aren't exactly pure. They're going there, and Jesus spoke to them about that before. They're just going there so they can get something from the situation. But understand, even though their motives may not be right, the Lord Jesus is still going there, and he's determined. He's never undermined in the importance of what he's doing. And as he often does, he takes this opportunity to accomplish the, the purposes of God in, in the face of even these ungodly motives that some of the other people might have or just selfish motives to see something. Obviously, those who want to be healed are there, and they're coming, and they have desire to, to be made whole. Now, I've often shared with my staff and with people in ministry and training people for ministry, you may have something in your mind that you're going to go do, and maybe it requires a place for silence and rest and quietness, and you're on your way there. Don't be surprised when moments like this come up. When you had all in your mind, I'm going to go spend some time with God, or I'm going to have some quiet time, or I'm going to take some time off, then something happens. Uh, and something occurs. There's a phone call. There's a message. There's a prayer request. And you're called away from what you thought you might get to do. That's part of life. In reality, when we all understand that we're all ministers of the gospel, we should be aware of those times and we shouldn't be frustrated. And Jesus certainly doesn't show any frustration here. It says when he gets out of the boat, it says he has compassion on them. And he begins to heal their sick. So that's kind of the scenario that, that we're in there, which leads us to, to, to this unique situation. It says, when he saw, saw the, the great multitude, he felt compassion for them. So he goes ashore, sees everybody there, and, 
And by the way, again, there's thousands and thousands of people there, 5,000 men alone, multitudes of women and children. So it's not unreasonable to assume anywhere from 20 to 25,000 people. Uh, Jesus, you know, tells the disciples, that they're giving him their advice, well, send them away, they're going to have to eat something. And Jesus said, don't send them away, you feed them. Give them something to eat. And they said, well, you know, we just have, we just have a couple of fish and these little loaves of bread. And the place is desolate, remember, is what the scripture says, which means it's a long way to the next village and the next town. In any case, most of these villages could have provided for the hordes of people that would probably come through to eat there. In fact, it's at the end of the day, the Bible says. If you take all these gospel presentations of this, you see little bits and pieces from each one that kind of give you the, the whole account from each disciple's perspective as they, as they record it to what's really going on. The, the day has gone on. Jesus has been healing. Uh, the people keep amassing. Thousands more have arrived now. And from John's account, and when you look in John chapter 6, you see that uh, Jesus had brought up the matter before already about feeding the multitudes. All right? Earlier in the day, he presented the matter uh, to the disciples. It was, uh, and so they're having to deal with this even beforehand. It, and, and Philip, you know, is, is asked there. Jesus asked him, you know, uh, uh, where are we, where, how are we going to feed these people? And by the way, Jesus didn't ask him, you know, uh, for he wasn't asking to get advice. He was asking to put him in a situation to see that, well, you could call it a test, but really to teach a lesson and a greater lesson. And by the way, Philip's the obvious one to ask. This is his area of town, all right? This is the area he's from. So where are we going to buy bread to feed these, he says to Philip. And again, if you follow the context of, of John, you see this is taking place a little earlier in the day. Now, Philip, being from that area, you think, he, you know, well, we're, we're going to have to, we're going to have to do something here. And their advice is, let's just send them away. Why? Why send them away? There's a lot of people here. This is not a small group. This is up to 20 plus thousand people. How in the world are we going to feed these people? Philip, don't send them away. Give them something to eat. His second response is, oh, even 200 denarii's worth of bread is not even sufficient for them for everybody to even get a little bit. That's his response in John. Now, by the way, a denarii is basically a day's pay. And so he's saying here, if I had over half a year's salary in my pocket, I still couldn't feed this multitude. There are far too many people here. Now, catch, catch what's happening here. As he deals with Andrew, who finds the little boy with the fish. He deals with Philip. You know, all these guys are there. And he's talking about them feeding them. They're, Jesus just pre keeps presenting to them this big mountain of an issue. A big, big problem. And like all big problems, Philip kind of comes back to where we've come to. You know, that's that, you know, broke man's Macarena, you know. <laughs> I got nothing but a big, big problem. But how many times do you look at a big, big problem and you start counting your money? Or lack of money? How many times do you But if I just had the money, we could deal with this. I know, you know, this is a big deal. And in, in, in our culture, in our mindset, it always gets back to how much this is going to cost. And that kind of what it comes down to, how much this is going to cost. I got an issue. I, you know, I got a problem. This problem bigger than me, 25,000 people to feed. It's not going to be done. And, 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 you know, Andrew walks up, says, you know, I got a little something here. I got some fish. I got some loaves. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I, that, I, that's, well, yeah, that's, you know, it's just. So they, they, here's this. The situation arises, and there's a problem bigger than anybody knows how to deal with but Jesus. And Jesus is pressing the problem because he wants them. Remember, this is all, this is, we're getting to the last year of his ministry. It's time to get the lesson, boys. It's time to understand. But they seem to be, even though they've witnessed miracle after miracle, solution after solution, problem solved after problem solved, dilemma handled after dilemma from the impossible, time in and time again, they're still not getting it. They, they've literally seen God have such through his son Jesus, such charge over the elements and the molecules that he can literally transform water into wine. He is so powerful that his words 
stop the storm stop, and, 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 and calm the waves in an instant. Oh, we got a problem here. Well, the problem here, it, it gets a little bigger than what they really understand. And Jesus is obviously, he wants to make a point here. And, and, and the point is not, because it's in all four Gospels, it's, I think it's a point that's for all of us. We need to get this lesson. And so often, we're presented with the same lesson over and over again. And we're always looking not at the, the immeasurable, great glory and sovereignty, supernatural power of God. We're looking at our own little finite resources. How, how, how can I fix this? What can I do? How much, how much is this going to cost? And, you know, they, they're not getting it. Because ultimately, in, in, uh, the great deal of this is, it has to do with stewardship, you know. What are we going to do with this big problem? You know, God's, God has given me a problem. And he's given me certain resources. What are we going to do? Like I said, Andrew comes up and says, you know, well, I got, yeah, I got this, man. This, this kid came up. Well, praise God, the kid is smarter than most people there. At least he brought his lunch. You know? You know he made some preparations. and Maybe it's his smart mother more than a smart kid, most likely. Amen. Can I get an amen from mothers at least? Amen. Now, honey, you take this and don't lose this. And you take care of this. And this will get to, you got enough here to get there. And you got enough to get home. She took care of him. But, you know, in the, in the simplicity and the beauty of children, you know, while Philip and Andrew are out trying to figure this whole thing out, this little boy kind of apparently sees the problem and says, hey, I'll share. Now, there are some liberal theologians who, who, who don't like to talk about the miraculous and the way they excuse this one away is they say, well, when the little boy brought out his lunch and he shared with everybody, the whole crowd was so moved that everybody shared their lunch with one another. But that's not what the Bible says. And it's better to believe what God says, even though it is miraculously supernatural. Uh, I believe that over the logic of mere men and sharing some lunches. But here's this little boy. He presents his lunch, you know, to, to, to Andrew and Philip. And uh, uh, they're probably sitting there looking at this lunch throughout the day. Maybe it started early in the morning. You know, here's Jesus. He's healing the multitudes. They've been given this commission to feed the multitudes. They got a lunch. Enough for a person, maybe two. And Jesus is still healing and he's speaking the kingdom of God. But here's this little boy. And this little boy steps up. And at least he understands some things about the power of giving. And a lot of this, this gets into this. There's a lot more than what we realize this lesson. But the, the, the big surface issue is here. Somebody understands the importance of planting a seed and giving. And what God can do with it, even if it's not big, even if it's not enough, when I do what God wants me to do, how important and how powerful it can be. Here's this little boy. In fact, I, I really believe, folks, I, this is a lesson most people don't want to hear, but I believe this is one of those areas that God continues to always be teaching us in and always be leading us in. And if there's one area these disciples are going to have to understand is how does the economy of God work? Because we're being called to do the impossible. In fact, every one of us in life face impossible issues, and we had best learn how the economy of God works. Now, a lot of people are still trying to figure out how the economy of men works. It doesn't. All right? We're always manipulating the economy and massaging the economy, whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats trying to create a fake economy, print more. You know, we just don't get it. But God has a way. Well, she says, if you follow my way, you do what I say. He has certain principles in Scripture about giving and receiving. We just get a hold of that. It transforms our life. But again, it's one of those lessons that we have to kind of keep coming back to, and we, we keep learning. But first of all, we have to learn that the glory of God will be demonstrated when I, when I become a giver. And just as this boy gives what he's got, it's not enough. It's not even a, a particle in the problem. But he gives what he got, God takes it, and manifests his glory. Sometimes I've, I've seen people who use that as, as an excuse for not giving. Well, my part's so little, I can't do much, so I don't know anything. You're like the guy who had the talents and, you know, just buried them. And how Jesus rebuked you for that. Because th th that's not what, God gave us a stewardship in life. So he discovers here all of a sudden now, if I'll do what God wants me to do, I'm going to see the glory of God. And certainly that was supernatural. But really... The essence of the lesson is that continual living is in continual giving. If I can just learn to get in a cycle and just learn to get in the flow of God's will for my life and just keep giving, then God keeps, he continues to give back. 
Now, this is such a vital lesson that the Lord Jesus actually, a few days later, months later, he walks them right down the road into the same scenario again. And they have to do it all over again and learn it all over again. In fact, it is so important and the lesson is so unique that we're going to take this the second miracle of feeding 5,000 and discuss the unique differences and the lesson that the Lord's teaching by having them to go through it all one more time because there's some powerful principles that we can learn. And, and, and really, this lesson isn't so much about money. It's about this issue of God big enough to do what he said he would do? And am I willing to believe him? It really gets to this point of discipleship. Will I do what the Lord says to do? Will I be obedient? Will I truly be a disciple? We don't have a lot of disciples today in the church. We've got a lot of church members. We've got a lot of church attenders. But there's not a lot of real hardcore disciples, you know. People are just saying, you know, what the Lord says, that's where I'm headed in life. They understand the call. They understand the commitment. They understand it's not about just, I believe, so that's good. You know, I hope I go to heaven and not to hell and get it, you know, whatever it might be. But this real issue of saying, I, I'm, I'm learning how to follow Jesus and present everything in my path and my life to Jesus so that he can be Jesus and be Lord in my situation and be glorified. And I can become more like Christ. Real discipleship. Boy, it's such a lost thing in, in the church today, and it needs to be, come back to this issue. You know, do I believe God? Up in the little things, is it really more blessed to give than it is to receive? Is it really, or is that just Bible words? I mean, when life's troubles come, when the insurmountable problems come, what do we do? We, we kind of look back and count? Yeah, I, I was thinking about this this, this 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 week and this little and this little boy and his food. You know what brought him to this decision and maybe what he had to go. Through. He, you know he could have been like most little children. I just want to help. You know, just one of those kind of kids that just. Hey, I know it's not much, but here, hey, I, I, I'll share. You know, now if you brought him into the this unique capitalistic world that we live in today, and planted him in our culture today, he'd probably be sitting there in the crowd with his little iPhone calculator. Let's see. I've got two fish. Each fish can sell for. Let me Google up what the average fish sells for today. Okay, that's five bucks a piece. Hey, let's see. Five bucks a fish. What if I cut them into fish sticks? I can sell each stick for five bucks a piece. And then the bread. How much is a loaf of bread? Well, let's multiply. I got five, five times five. Well, if I slice those up, I can multiply that. How can I take what I got and make some more with it? How can I turn this into money? Now, praise the Lord, I believe God gives us the ability to do that. There's also God's given us the call to share, the call to, to, to give, the call to love, the call to meet a need. And he gets it, and he presents it. Jesus said, you bring them to me. You know, what happens when we have these issues like this that are big? Sometimes we, we just, we, we don't get it. We don't get it. We had a beneficence that was presented this week, and Tim was talking to me about it, and I said, yeah, let's, let, we need to give some money to that. And I said, especially because we need some money. Some people don't get that. You know? They don't get that. If I need something, why in the world should I give something? Because I understand that in giving, I'll receive. You reap what you sow. Don't you love that story where Jesus is telling about the parable of the sower of the seeds, and the, there's several versions of it through the gospel, but one version of it, he's talking about the farmer, and now the farmer goes out and he puts the seed in the ground and the seed dies and the seed brings forth fruit and, and a harvest is created. And it says a little line like this, but the farmer knows not how, but the life is in the seed. In other words, God put a principle into motion. You call it a law, if you would. It's like a law of gravity. You throw something, something comes down, right? It goes up, it comes down. That's the way it works. Unless you get on the realm of outer space. But in this space, this is the way it works. The only way you're going to overcome that is another higher law, greater law, which is the law of aerodynamics. All right? So, that's just a principle. God says you give and it should be given. Why? Because the life's in the seed. But that's any seed, according to whatsoever you, you, you sow, you know, that's what you're going to reap. So, if I sow, then, then I can reap from it. But if I don't sow it, then I don't reap it. And so, here's a kid who gets it. But it really all boils back down to this issue of the sovereignty of God. All right? The sovereignty of God. God was saying, don't send them away. Why? Because I'm the need meter. 
Don't send them someplace that the need's not even going to be met. You already know that if they leave here, there's not one village around here that can sustain this kind of crowd coming into that community, hungry, looking for food. Don't send them away. Leave them here. Why? Because you are standing in the sovereignty of God. You are standing in the omnipotent presence of God. Don't send them somewhere else. The answer is, well, we only have two, you know, five loaves and two fish. You know, I know that most of us have this, this inflated spiritual idea of ourselves that's not always true. It's like, boy, if I was there, I'd have told those disciples, don't be so stupid. Hello. If you were there, you'd be doing the same thing. Because, listen, we do the same thing right now. Oh, let's see, how can we figure this out? What can we do? How can we meet this need? How's this going to work? I, just, I can't do this. I, just, I don't have enough money. I, and we have all these answers. And we don't realize. It, it's kind of like, you know, I'm just, it, it's, it's kind of like standing in front of Niagara Falls and saying, Paul, I'm thirsty. I wish I had something to drink. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? They're in the presence of divinity. They're in the presence of a supernatural and holy God. And he says, hey, here's, what the, here's, here's how we're going to resolve this problem. You know, you, you might not realize the whole thing, but here's what I want you to do. You bring it all to me. Whatever we got, bring them here to me. Bring them here to me. Because when I place it in his hand, things can begin to happen. Because maybe you don't believe it, but I do believe with all my heart that not only do we sense this and see this physical world that's around us right now, we can reach out and we touch, we, tell, we, 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 we see, we, we, we kind of compute everything on the basis of what our senses say, you know. Uh, but there's another world in operation besides this physical realm, and it's a spiritual world. And even though we can't smell it and see it and taste it and feel it, it's still real. There really is a God, a Father, a Son, the Holy Spirit, all right? There really is a devil. There really are demons. There are really angels. There really is an operating world all around us in this moment that is spiritual. In the physical world, well, I just got to see it to believe it. In the spiritual world, I just got to believe it to see it. All right? In the physical world, I look at my needs. In the spiritual realm, I look and see he can meet every need. In the physical world, I look, I got a problem. I got a problem solver in the spiritual realm. I got somebody who's bigger than my mountain, deeper than my ocean, bigger than my problem. He's God, God, God. And so often we, we forget to realize this spiritual world over here. When I was preaching recently on why Christians deal with suffering, I, I used the illustration of John on the Isle of Patmos. He said, I, John, was on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day in the spirit. What was he saying? I was in a physical place. I was in a spiritual place. I'm in the worst place, and you can imagine, a prison island, but I'm having church. I'm walking with God. I'm in the Spirit. And so we have to somehow come back and say, well, I do believe God and whatever God is saying, that, that's what I, I, I will trust Him for and that's what I, I'll believe Him for. But we're so tempted to focus first and foremost on our problem. That's why even with issues of sins and sin and things like that, we say, well, I just can't overcome this. In reality, God's bigger than that sin. God's bigger than that stronghold. God's bigger than that issue. So he says, you bring them here to me. Obviously referring to the loaves and the fishes. What was he saying? I think he's saying something like, you know, I know you, you, you didn't have sufficient food, Andrew, Philip. I knew we didn't have sufficient money. And I knew there was no way of getting the food or getting the money. And I never expected you to feed them from your own resources or by your own power. I'm asking you to feed them. I was asking you to trust me. Without having to tell you, I was giving you the opportunity to bring this whole problem over to me and trust me and rest in that. And so the real question is, in our own life, will we learn the lesson to say, I am willing to bring it all to Jesus? And that just brings us to the last two points. One is, is this issue of service. The secret to successful service in our spiritual life is realizing that God is bigger than all these things and he is sovereign. If he's called me to do something, he's going to perform it. He which began a good work in you, he will perform it. So what are you facing today? God's bigger than that. What are you having to deal with? God can take care of that. But the first issue in this whole idea of service is this one thing of obedience. I just need to do what the Lord said. How am I going to feed these people? Give it to him. What's he telling me? Just bring it to him. Bring it to him. Whatever he's asking, whatever he's calling for, whatever he's desiring, don't, make, don't, don't wait for excuses. You know, he said, hey, just t tell everybody to sit down. 
Because you 20-something thousand people are all standing trying to look and see what's going on, who's getting healed, what's happening, who's shouting, who's getting excited. You know, everybody's kind of standing around watching, listening. So Jesus tells them to sit down, bring me the food, tell the people to sit down. And back to, he says, you know, this has to be what I, what I would call orderly service. If God gives you some details about what you're supposed to do, follow those details even though you don't understand them. He set them down, the scripture says, he made them to sit, the Greek word is prase, prase, which literally means garden bed by garden bed in groups of hundreds and groups of fifties. Y'all know what a garden bed looks like. You have a row of peas, you know, and you have a little place you can walk through, then you got a row of corn, and you got a little place you can walk through, you have a row of something else, you know. That's garden bed by garden bed. Now, why did he do that? Well, to be able to get to everybody and to feed everybody, he had a little order the way he wanted it done. We have aisles now that we can carry the food down and reach everyone and everybody can be taken care of. Sometime, we don't understand when the Lord's given us some details in our life that we need to attend to and to, that we should carefully attend to those things. The miracle... Was, was supernatural. It was all but invisible. He blesses the food. He gives it to them in the baskets. They start carrying it out. And it's like every time they reach in, there's something there. You know? Every time they put their hand in, something else comes out. Shouldn't be anything there. I just took it out. But there it is again. It comes back. There's no fanfare, no dramatic change from little to much. It's just the miracles. It's kind of almost, the magnitude was, was evident in the fact that everybody ate, which is the supply. The Greek word here for, for to, when it says they were satisfied is the word chartazo. And it was used to, uh, when you took animals to, and filled the trough of food, they would eat until they were full and then they would just leave. All right? They didn't want anything else, so they were done. That's the satisfaction. Everybody had enough to eat, not only enough to eat to fiddle them nutritionally, but to satisfy them physically. Oh, that's all I want. And by the way, I'd like to have a taste of that. Can you imagine? This is food out of nowhere. This is, this is supernatural food. I mean, the first loaves and fish are gone, and now there's more. Where'd that come from? From the creative power, from the Word of God, it's just happening, all right? That's, I, you know, I don't know, I'm sure somebody said, I don't know where they got this fish. That's the best fish I ever ate. <laughs> somebody said, I don't know where, where that bread came from, but I would like the recipe. That is the best. I mean, there's no tainting into it. There's no preservatives. It's just all natural from heaven. Supernatural food satisfies them. And in fact, it's the same word, this chartazo, it's used in the Beatitudes when Jesus said, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you'll be filled. You'll be completely satisfied. Not only just satisfied, you're happy about it. There's completion in it. There's, it's, it's everything you expect it to be and even more. In fact, it was so powerful. In John, it says the people tried to come and take Jesus by force and make him their king. He didn't allow it. Let me close with this. From the one incident, there's four or five little simple truths here, and I'm going to just give you a sentence on each one. First of all, we need to understand the believer has no inalienable rights to personal freedoms and benefits. You say, what do you mean? Everything we have including our needs even. Everything we have, including our rights, should be surrendered to the Lord. God, here's my life. How do you want to accomplish your will? If you just want a portion, if you want 100%, it's really all yours anyway. If you want my shoes, they're yours. You want my shirt, they're yours. You want my car. Everything is yours, Lord. Just, and uh, can I be willing to say, hey, you know, I give it all. Little boy, because that's my food, I want it. But he, ex he, he became expendable. He came, he came to a place of service. Also, Jesus taught him through this one event right here that meeting the physical needs of others, <clears throat> everything was really all about meeting the spiritual needs. There's a lot of social gospel that takes place. In other words, we as the church, we reach out, we feed the hungry, we shelter those who are the homeless, and we, we reach out and we minister to people on all kinds of levels. And our church does a great job of ministering to people on all different kinds of levels. But the uniqueness about Believer's Fellowship, when we meet social needs, is we do it with a message. We want people to know that Jesus is the reason we're doing what we're doing. We want people to know that Jesus is the answer for all their life dilemmas. We want people to know that the salvation that's available through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just want to go to the nurse and visit. We don't want to just go down and feed somebody. We want them to know that Jesus is the reason their needs are being met and their lives can be changed as a result of giving their hearts and their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always accompanied with a kingdom message. Number three, you always do things in an orderly and careful manner just as the Lord does. Creation was perfect order. When Jesus created the earth and then he created the atmosphere and the animals, he put the trees in place. Everything was created perfectly for man's environment, you know. 
God created it so that when man stepped and put his foot in the garden, there was air to breathe. And when he breathed it, there were plants to take in what he breathed out, purify it, and put it back out into the atmosphere. Things like trees. Isn't that supernatural? Everything you see about God is this way. You know, and, and the scripture says that in the church we should do everything in an orderly manner. Four, what do you need to learn, gentlemen? You need to trust God to supply what even seems impossible. Even though it doesn't look like there's any way for it to happen. Five, the plan of evangelism, the plan of redemption involves not only the witness and the work, and also the means of all of us who belong to him. God is about changing the world around us, and it involves our lives. It involves our money. It involves our time. It involves our talents. Everything God has called us to and everything God wants to do, we are a part of that with everything that we are. There's no little partial part. We say, you know, uh, that, uh, that's all God can have. It's, no, here you are. That's discipleship. And this, you know, again, this is Jesus going into the last year of the ministry with these men. They've got to get this down. We've got to get this down. How powerful our lives would be if when we're presented with impossible situations and impossible demands, we just learn to obey God, hear what he says, and see what he will do in spite of the situation, in spite of ourselves. Powerful, powerful lesson powerful message. The issue is, like the disciples, can we hear it? Can we receive it? Can we respond to it the way God would have us respond to it? Can we not make excuses for not being and not doing, not saying all the things that God would have us do or say or be? We just, we just need to come to back to that place of realizing it's all about following the one who loves me most. His name is Jesus. It's all about giving all to him who gave me all, loving him. With all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my body, and all my strength. And the second commandment, love everybody around me. Like I love myself. and Like I love him. Amen. Would you stand with your heads bowed? for that and uh, Mike it's always a great time Micah Combs is coming this morning to, he's given his life to Christ and uh, he's going to be baptized once you come over here Micah and Micah won't you share with everybody uh, kind of what brought you to this point and why you get baptized this morning well I just know I needed to better myself because up until now I really didn't have any good direction in life I've been a series of disappointments and letdowns and I spoke to one of my friends and he told me how the Lord had changed his life and made a difference really big impact on him and that Jesus loved me more than anything else in this world so I invited him into my life and uh, be my savior and to change my life for good I look forward to learning how to be uh, more like him and to be a better man in the future amen praise the Lord <laughs> Amen. praise the Lord that's what it's all about like I told Micah this morning you know this is symbolic that he's going to go down in the water and the old Micah is dead but praise the Lord, he's going to come up, and the new Micah is alive to walk for Christ. Amen. What a great symbolism the Lord gave us in baptism and uh, to show what we are doing when we come to know Christ. So, Micah, this morning, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, buried in his death, raised in, in his likeness. Amen. Amen. Just want to make a few closing announcements while I'm already up here. Uh